Prejudice, racism, notions of superiority, these issues are of not much importance now when the white Creole population has little of the economic and social power that it once possessed. But the memories persist of humiliation and denial of rights because of racial and social prejudice. Sir Ellis Clark, the first president of the Republic, a distinguished lawyer, tells us of his school days at St. Mary's College in Port of Spain. I entered St. Mary's College, I think, in the year 1929. So that's a long time ago. At that time, there were never less than 20 divertis at St. Mary's. And virtually all my life at St. Mary's, I was in class with one divertai or another. And the influence was profound. I, it is easy, it is very easy in today's world to look back and speak of the prejudices of those years without recognizing all the prejudices there were generally. There would be people who would tell you that the prejudices at St. Mary's were very great. In a sense, yes, they were. What were they based on? A number of factors. It wasn't simply a question of saying the French Creoles against the rest of the community. It was a question of status, of wealth, of background, of a number of factors. I say this because everything must be judged in the light of its period. My wife, who is from Grenada, for instance, was quite shocked and still remains so and talks about it of coming to a play at St. Mary's College. Now, this is long after I left. We got married in 1952, so this is post-52. And saying, so they don't have colored boys in the plays. Oh. And, and saying, again, she was amazed at the state of affairs. You've got to understand things. Now, somebody who was in charge of the plays in my day was the great Father Graf. Mm -hmm. And Father Graf was the last person you'd accuse of prejudice in the accepted sense of the term. But he simply fell in with the, with the times. And the attitude at the time was that the Shakespearean characters were white. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it would look a little ludicrous to have a black person portraying a Shakespearean character. Today, the world would not accept that as an explanation. And yet, the people who said at the time were genuine about it. Now, there were other aspects. I mean, there were things, say, like Sea Scouts. And there was a feeling that First Trinidad, which was First Trinidad Sea Scouts, was a very prejudiced troop. Again, yes, there was some prejudice. I was asked by Father English to join First Trinidad. And I went along, and I frankly wasn't very keen on it. And they never voted me in. Now, they had a perfect right not to vote me in. <laughs> that there was prejudice, yes. And it used to be that to be white meant to be privileged. You were part of the power structure, and they looked after each other. No. I suppose I was fortunate. I wouldn't say I got a lot of work from the firms, but I did get work from the firms. So my own personal experience has not led me, perhaps, to be, shall I say as bitter, as recriminatory as many of my colleagues and many people who were of my time. I had it relatively easy from a personal point of view. But the fact is that compared with today, there was tremendous prejudice, and this was laid at the door always of the French Creole. Even though the manager, the managing director of Barclays Bank, when there was only one main branch in Port of Spain, would probably be anything but <laughs> French Creole but we still used that expression. Right. So the French Creole element in Trinidad bore the brunt of whatever were the sins of the hierarchy of the right. day. It was interesting to find out that for many Trinidadians, 
white people are all known as French Creoles, whether their background is French or not. Among the white community, however, the distinction can be sharply drawn between who is French Creole and who's not. I often have to feel somehow that I need to um, insist that I'm married to the Virtai and that my roots are very much in the Anglo Creole or the British don't, Creole side. Don't you feel like you're apologizing a little bit though? No, I know, I, I know because, because I feel that um, we are all, we are lumped into a, 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 a group of, we, we, are, we are given this label that is inaccurate and I feel that I should be proud of my, my roots and where mm. I've come from and I don't want to be swallowed up into something that I, I'm a part of only by marriage. What was the attitude of your, your parents and grandparents to the existence of French Creoles? They are in, a, in an Anglo community in Trinidad alongside a French community. Um, I, I, they were, I'm sure they were aware of, a, of, a, of a, a gap. We never came across any French Creoles. If you're judging people by name, there were never any Rostons or any Dumiacs or any Divertis in any of our family gatherings or there was no mention ever of any French Creole names. All the, all the people my grandparents knew all went to, all went to sort of the same school as my grandmother or they were relatives or they were, it was a, there was a, I think there was a religious divide as well, um, which probably dictated who they were friendly with because it was people that they had been to school with and offshoots of those friends and so on. V.S. Naipaul wrote in his book, The Middle Passage, about the white community in Trinidad, that they were, um, were good playing quattro on a beach, drinking rum and uh, working in a bank. They didn't need any education because of their family connections. It was a pretty caustic view of, of white people. I'm just wondering, if, couldn't you give me, if there was any truth to it? I think there's some justification in it. You do? I think that a, that a lot of, not a lot, but there must have been quite a few positions in Port of Spain, senior positions in companies that were filled by white people who got where they were because of who they knew. Almost like an inheritance. An inheritance, their right to assume positions in these very safe old companies that imported and sold, imported and sold, imported and sold. And I think there is some justification in a little bit of bitterness from outside in that, you know, they who are capitalizing on well-established firms, well names, names that could go to the banks, for instance, and, and be known and respected. And somebody coming in from outside trying to penetrate that, that sort of safe, well-established um, net would, would have found it hard and, and maybe we can try and see maybe when Ni Naipaul is cynical we know but yeah. we can maybe see where he's coming from. I, I myself in my limited working experience I have come across people in positions that I didn't particularly think were very bright. You really have to wonder that their conversation is ter isn't terribly sophisticated and you look at something they've written a letter or so and you think to yourself I wonder how he got where he is because he really is he really capitalizing on hardworking people under him and has he got where he is because he was literally ushered into the post mm -hmm. because of who his parents knew when he was young and he somehow rose to the top not through anything not through anything any cerebral um it's, it's, it's cerebral. His, it, it's his father and so according to Jennifer Deverte the stereotype of the white Trinidadian as privileged and not necessarily competent is valid but Jennifer Franco has a somewhat different point of view. I, I think that it's a misconception. Probably they did party hard and play hard, but in my experience in the oil fields anyway, and I'm sure in the sugar and places like that, you know, the, the men were very hard, very hard indeed. Mm -hmm. They were, some of them were shipped in the oil fields, which would have been from three o'clock in the afternoon till 11 o'clock, or from 11 in the night till seven, or from seven until three, and there was no, you don't go and work in an oil refinery and slack off, you know. And in my father's case, for instance, he worked 24 hours on and 24 off. And if he was out working until the, until the next oil field day began, which was at 7 o'clock, if he came at 5 to 7, he just changed his clothes and went back out and, and worked. Mm. Morning and night was the same thing in the oil fields. If you had to work, you had to work on Christmas Day, Easter, you know, I mean, I... I saw my father and my uncles and all the all the, the fathers of my friends and so on working very hard, and so I've always not liked that stereotype particularly. So where does all this leave us? 
In Trinidad, to be gone through is to be past your prime, to be no longer of use. Are the French Creoles as a distinct group gone through? How do you see the future of French Creole life in Trinidad? I don't know that, that really there is a future. Um, French Creole life is, is much diluted now and, and really doesn't manifest itself in any way to any degree that you could see this is how French Creoles live anymore. I mean, you know, we are just part of, of, of what's left of the white Trinidad community and we don't, I don't think, live any differently from the average white Trini as French Creoles, you know. We, so, in a way, I think it's a, it, it, we've lost something. I really do. I think that there was, although there was a lot, I'm sure, that, that was wrong with the way we conducted ourselves as a group of people because there's a lot of prejudice and a lot of snobbism and, and so forth. Yet, there was a lot that was good too. I mean, when you hear the old people speak about the generosity of, 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 of their parents and, and, and the closeness of their communities and, and, and the way they shared in adversity as well as when they were well off. I mean, you know, they, they really had something special and um, it's something that we've lost. Which is why what we're doing is so important, I think, that we can record that and, and, and continue to celebrate it in a way, you know, uh, it's important. And I feel that I'm fortunate to have had just a small part of it, even if just the tail end in my real flower days as a boy. It used to be that French Creoles didn't run businesses. But this group of cousins is far more familiar with an oil rig or a spreadsheet than with cultivating cocoa. However, they try to keep the old traditions alive by getting together for a big Sunday lunch after mass. And they celebrate the culture of their ancestors with, of course, food, so beloved of the French, and wine and lots of talk. And at the end of the lunch, they raise their glasses in a toast. And what they're drinking is a powerful concoction called a sekit, which, interestingly enough, means it's over. We're finished. We're quits. 